Hello one and all, welcome to Seen Through Glass. Welcome back to Dubai. I'm out here in the Middle East ahead of the final race of the 2021 F1 season. But before I head to Abu Dhabi for that race, I've got a few days here in Dubai to explore and make some content for you guys. And if you watch a lot of automotive content, you'll know that any trip to Dubai isn't complete without a visit to one of the many insane car dealerships. I'm hoping to do things a little bit differently today because right now I'm at Tamini Classics. In my mind, the only super classic car dealership in Dubai. So instead of endless Devos and Elvers and whatever hypercars you might imagine, there are Daytonas, 512Ms, Carrera GTs, XJ220s. You think of it, it's basically here. For me, this place is heaven. So I'm gonna kick things off here with this quite incredible Ferrari Daytona. This is kind of one of the flagship cars down here at Tamini. Uh, as I walk around, some of the cars I show you are for sale. Some of them are kind of part of the Tamini collection. And this is one of those cars. Absolutely jaw-dropping specification in my mind, but a very interesting story for this car. Firstly, let's note that it is one of the plexiglass Daytonas, more desirable in a collector's mind. It does look cool, I have to say. It's kind of, you know, plexiglass front end housing those front headlights but yes the color the interior spec oh it is delightful uh, this car has been fully restored by Ferrari themselves using their classic a department but actually that's not the only sort of interesting element because paperwork or history tells us that at some point the car must have got involved in kind of an accident or, or some kind of issue whilst it was at Ferrari because they took a new chassis off the production line, scraped off the chassis number and re-stamped the original chassis number onto a new chassis. That is really loud. I don't even know what it, oh my. I don't even know what that was, but it was making a lot of noise. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, so the, the owner got an entirely new car from Ferrari, but with the original chassis number on, something which apparently used to happen quite a lot back in the day. Now it seems like kind of a shocking thing to think of, but yeah, more commonplace back in the 60s or 70s. Um, so yeah, absolutely stunning, gorgeous looking car. I mean, I just love, for example, that wooden steering wheel. Oh my God, delightful. So yeah, always a pleasure seeing this. Where do we go from here? Um, let's come across to this, a much more modern classic, the Carrera GT. Now, any Carrera GT is special, but this one not only is incredibly low mileage, but is on its original tires. Now, for a collector, that's gonna be a very interesting thing. If you're planning to drive this car, I would suggest you put some fresh rubber on. <laughs> I'm not sure it's a great idea to be running around in a Carrera GT, well, in tires that are, well, yeah, well over 10 years old now. So, uh, very cool to see, beautiful condition. And actually, because we're right here by the window, I wonder, sometimes if you just move in the right way, you can see some sort of carbon weave underneath the quite thin paint. But yeah, absolutely stunning thing, immaculate condition. And actually, the Carrera GT and the Z8 just behind it from the same collector. So yeah, very nice to see those. I really want to go and talk about those 3599s, but let's come back to them. Because firstly, 512M, right right in the middle of the showroom, obviously uh, sort of the final iteration of the Testarossa, I guess we could call it. Uh, you get these sort of glass covered headlights rather than the pop-ups, these very interesting spinny wheels. <laughs> they look like they are spinning, but they are of course not. Um, I don't know, do people like them? I know again, from a sort of collector point of view, these were designed because so few were made and it was kind of like a last hurrah for that, well, yeah, mid-engined V12 Ferrari. After this, they went back to that traditional front engine version version with the 550, the 575, etc. So yeah, very cool thing. And I like it because it's got a slightly more modern line. I would have this, I think, over Testarossa, but maybe, maybe that's not the right thing to say. I don't know, I'm a fan. Spinning behind myself, we have got
got an XJ220. Now, I'm pretty sure you're all going to know the story of the XJ220, but of course, it started its life as a kind of, well, a shed project at Jaguar. The team of sort of engineers and designers were like, oh, I feel like we could do better than what we're currently doing for the road cars. Um, so they were kind of secretly working on it at weekends. And it kind of gathered pace so much and became such a sort of amazing concept or idea that Jaguar sort of, well, head honchos thought, well, heck, let's, let's launch this concept car and see what happens. So initially it launched with a, an all-wheel drive system and a hunk and great V12 engine to try and tie into sort of the racing programs that Jaguar were doing, or at least Jaguar's heyday. Uh, and everyone went, oh my God, amazing. I definitely want one of those. Like, how, where do I pay? Uh, and then once they'd actually kind of taken a whole load of orders, which I think were like over a thousand orders or like that, they realized that it was actually going to be very difficult to make in real life. Uh, so suddenly it became rear wheel drive. It then got a twin turbo uh, V6 instead. And a whole lot of people went, eh, I'm no longer that keen on that car. And this actually was one of the cancelled orders because that's what happened. A lot of people sort of thought, well, actually, I don't want the car you're now building. I'm going to cancel my order. So this particular car lay on the Jaguar factory floor for about three years uh, before finally being sold, I think, to Malta, then got shipped to Singapore. It's been all over the world, this car, um, but it's now looking absolutely spectacular because it's had all of the sort of Don Law upgrades. If you don't know, Don Law Racing do a whole load of work with XJ220s. They are the world's leading XJ220 specialist and service centre and, and all these different things. And they do various upgraded parts to sort of make the car breathe and perform better. So this has had every single one of the sort of Don Law upgrades you can get and it is in spectacular condition. Uh, most XJ220s that I've been lucky enough to see have always looked a little bit tatty. Um, but this thing with its wheels, oh my god, is absolutely jaw-dropping. So let's come on to these 599s because you know I'm a big Ferrari guy and whilst I fully admit these are definitely what you'd be calling modern classics, would you even call them classics? They're just sort of modern-ish cars because none are GTOs, they're all GTBs, but very interesting GTBs. So on the right, just a very nicely specced, sort of standard, standard 599. But I say nicely specced because black with a lovely red interior and open this up, stunning carbon seats, in red. So yeah, a beautiful car, but maybe nothing theoretically that special. So we move on because the middle car I think is a really cool spec. It's the triple layered yellow paint with, I'm going to come back to it in two seconds, blue leather interior. Ooh, I'm getting overexcited. And then all genuine GTO parts, not mechanical parts, but visual parts from factory. So the car was ordered with all the kind of upgrades. So the upgraded grille, these lovely wheels, loads of different carbon fiber components. So yeah, Ferrari actually installed these for the owner when he spec'd the car. And then yes, look at that. I said it when I went to Finale Mondiale and I saw the 812 Competizione Aperta, which actually, now I think of it, is near on identical spec to this. Triple A yellow paint and blue interior. It's a very historical look for Ferrari. And look at the details there. We've got the fire extinguisher over there. The kind of side kick plate, I guess, or where you're going to be putting your foot or resting your foot with the accelerator. It's just absolutely immaculate. The condition of this particular car is incredible. Very cool to see. Um, oh, don't shut that quite right. I am... Um, I'm really liking that. Weirdly, I've never re enjoyed driving standard 599 GTBs that much, um, but I think they are aging so well. And in the UK, they're sort of sub 100k, quite easily sub 100k, despite the fact you'll do about 3 mpg. That seems like a bit of a bargain to me for a fairly modern V12 Ferrari. We then come on to, though, potentially the most interesting of this three. Initially, spec-wise, maybe you're thinking, oh, no, I, I prefer the previous two. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe you're going, this looks amazing. But this has got a very interesting story. This could or should be an HGTE, the sort of handling pack special, the final iteration of the 599, because it's got those various components on it, carbon brakes, the right wheels, carbon components, stuff like that. But pretty much all HGTEs should have it embossed somewhere on the seat. Some of them don't, but there's no actual sort of key visual markers apart from some of the spec options that this is actually an HGTE pack. And then most interestingly, and something that the guys here at Tamini have never seen on a Ferrari before, the kick plate has a Scuderia Ferrari badge, and that is Felipe Massa's signature. Now, does that mean that this was Felipe Massa's car? Did he gift it to someone? Did they do a very limited run of Felipe Massa spec'd cars? We don't quite know. The team at Tamini are trying to find that out. Um, but it's a really interesting and quirky car. And probably, again, maybe more of a sort of collector 
item um, because of its sort of maybe history and relevance um, but heck it's going to be a great thing to drive so yeah of the three let me know which one would you go for let's pretend for a second that the massa connection isn't there just as cars themselves i'm definitely still leaning towards that one very very cool let's show some love towards porsche because you know if i'm not talking about ferraris i'm probably talking about porsches or jaguars already done the jaguars already done the ferraris yes moving on this is a really interesting 911s you see the badge at the back 2.4 not quite right this has got a 2.7 rs engine in it because originally it was actually delivered to a le mans winning driver al Hobart, which is absolutely amazing but then it was sold on and the next owner unfortunately cracked the engine the very fragile engines in here so he cracked the engine and they replaced it with a full rs engine so it's kind of like almost like a bit of a hot rod or a sleeper spec it's got the single mirror spec i love it it's not overly restored it's looking in sort of good condition as in good usable condition you've got that absolute monster of an engine so yeah very very cool i'm a big fan of that i have driven a 70s 911 it blew my mind um, but i kind of want to have a go now again that i'm kind of more into the porsche life uh, loads more interesting bits knocking around of course four c's people had a big go at me for not talking about four c's when i did my recent 8c video um, i don't really see the links between those cars apart from maybe visually and of course the fact that they're made by alfa romeo but in my mind the 8c and the 4c very different things uh, but anyway very nice here to see a coupe and a spider but i want to move on because firstly an slr 722 edition these are insanely valuable these days the kind of forgotten Gotten hypercar of the noughties. We've got, of course, the Carrera GT. Oh, where are you? If I lift you right up. There you go, back by the window. And the Enzo of this era. And the SLR often gets overlooked because it was a hyper GT. It wasn't all about sort of track records it wasn't all about dynamic driving it was about sort of long distances at great speed when i drove it i found it a really interesting car a lot more sort of visceral than i was expecting but yeah it's just something you want to you know hammer along on the motorway or the autobahn the 722 more power a little bit better it was the sort of improved version what i like about this one is you kind of wouldn't even notice apart from if you were picking up on various cues because you were a sort of slr nerd it does just look like a black slr so yeah big fan of that and also intrigued by by this a one of one SLS so this is a full sort of they call it, I think design or designio spec you know think of uh, I'm trying to think Ferrari tailor-made Lamborghini ad personum uh, Mercedes do have their designio designio I'm not saying that right because I don't say it very often because it's quite rare to see such a bespoke Mercedes but yeah um, I, I wish I could remember the name of this now it's got a weird pearl name Oh my god, anyway, it's a funny old funky colour with a beautiful kind of ivory interior, again, fully bespoke. But is it just me who's thinking SLS is <gasps> ageing so well? And I know values are starting to really creep up. I've never driven one, weirdly. Never driven one, always been intrigued. Um, and Shmi will kill me right now, but I kind of prefer the looks of the standard car to the Black Series. There's something more slightly elegant, I suppose, about it. But yeah, these two, very, very cool. Moving on past the beautiful four C's, I want to come this way because, <gasps> yes, the piece de la resistance for me today inside the showroom is this. Yes, surprise, surprise, another Ferrari. This is a 612 Sesenta. Uh, only, I think, 60 of these were made, and it was about celebrating the 60th anniversary of production cars for Ferrari. Loads of sort of upgrading parts and components. This particular spec is blowing my mind. Most Sesentas I've ever seen have been two tone which isn't a great look. This, I think it could even be Rosso Froco, the triple ed paint that I used on my Abarth Project Reposto, but even if it's not, it's a stunning red with, yes, a tan interior. I mean, just look at that gloriousness. So, so pretty, uh, especially with these kind of polished rims with the silver Ferrari badges in the center and the silver brake calipers. It's a really classy, beautiful spec. And I have to say, I'm really, coming around to the 612 Scaglietti. You're going to think I'm mad, but my next daily? Uh, four seats? It's kind of usable. Uh, Vicky's going to watch this and literally text me straight away saying, no, you're an idiot. Um, but they're still sort of, sort of affordable. Okay, not the Sesentas. So these are super rare. It's basically every box ticked. They're the most desirable 612s out there, I think. 
maybe not the two tones because it depends whether you like that kind of thing but you've got the whole panoramic glass sunroof and that kind of elements but yeah this thing is just so so pretty again part of the kind of collection here not for sale otherwise I think I would be making some kind of low ball offer um, I've just noticed as well just to come back to this interior because oh it's delightful look at the white dials <gasps> little details like that that just add up to this spec being on point yes I'm a big fan I love it I kind of want it it might sound weird to say, but there's something so refreshing and exciting about seeing such incredible classic and modern classic cars here in Dubai. You know, the, as great as this place is, I do sometimes worry that the car culture here is all just about the newest and shiniest thing, you know, and usually the newest and shiniest hypercar. And that's great and it's brilliant and don't get, me, don't get me wrong, I'd love to go and check that out as well. But for me personally, this is such a, an important part of car culture. The history, the stories, you know, it's not necessarily always about the best version or the best iteration or the best condition. It's about the story. And that's what I love about the cars here on display at Tamini's. You know, some of them are super low mileage or, you know, super rare, but a lot of them just have fascinating backstories. And it's great to hear that people in and around the Middle East aren't just obsessing over the latest and greatest from Bugattis and Ferraris and McLarens and things like that. They're also looking back on the history and its past. So yeah, I'm going to sit here for a little bit longer, let this all sink in and just boggle bits, then I've got a couple more things to show you. Yeah, before we head off, let me show you a few other cool things down here at Tamini that aren't just the cars. Uh, actually, firstly, check out this wall of classic sort of mopeds and scooters. Very cool to see. Unfortunately, don't know what many of them are. This is not my world. Uh, but this definitely is my world because in this corner, sort of weirdly, randomly at least, but very coolly, uh, we've got loads of Toro Rosso STR8 parts. So that's a kind of um, commemorative or, or replica nose or front end, I guess, of the car. We've got another sort of display wheel. But then we've got also uh, end plates of a rear wing, signed end plates of a rear wing, uh, an actual steering wheel, kind of well used, you can see there. This is signed by Jean Eric Verne, who was a driver at the time. Um, so, yeah, I think they're going to build up this corner and have loads more stuff on display. But the interesting things continue well, firstly, with the kids at uh, Alfa Romeo, big fan, um, but with this. Bruff Superior. Now, bike fans, you're going to know a lot more about this than I do, but essentially, Bruff, an iconic bike maker, especially in this part of the world, because of Lawrence of Arabia, T.E. Lawrence. Uh, how do we describe him? I mean, famed adventurer, spy, writer, man of mystery. I mean, it's all-out legend, uh, and he was actually obsessed with Bruff Superiors and SS100s. Had, I think, seven of them back in the day. Uh, obviously, the company is still going, and this is the latest version, but it's actually the first First Bruff to be back, or Bruff Superior at least, to be back in Arabia since T. Lawrence, which is kind of nuts. So, um, you know, when this came into the country, they were finding out that it's the first time a Bruff Superior has been back. So, some real nice history there. As I say, unfortunately, a little bit over my head, I'm not that knowledgeable on bikes, so let me know below anything else that I should be aware of with this. I think it looks stunning. So, yeah, lots of cool bits and bobs, as I say, behind and amongst the cars, and that continues through here as I make my way into the offices past that lovely poster of the Ferrari Formula One cars up to 2011. I could really nerd out there, let's move on, otherwise you all might get a bit bored. Uh, but yeah, this is one of the, uh, well, the head honcho salesman's office here, and we've got a lovely V16 engine as a desk. <laughs> That's mad, isn't it? Uh, loads of other sort of memorabilia knocking around down at the thick end. But I just want to show you here this poster, look at this commemorative or maybe even historic poster of the 1981 Dubai Grand Prix. Very cool. They actually just had the historic Grand Prix the other day, which I missed, uh, unfortunately, but some other cool posters here as well. But I, I really like that, I have to say, as well, of course, as the Gold Leaf Team Lotus bodywork. Yeah, not a bad place to work. You've not only got cool stuff to look at inside, but then you can step out here into <laughs> this array of insane classics and modern classics. Wow, wow, wee wow. Super glad I came down here today because I visited Tamini a few times before but never done a proper video and this place just blows my mind. What would you pick from the cars that I've shown you? I mean, there are a few cars I haven't shown you because there's just so much here, but whilst the 612 does pull on my heart, I've become weirdly obsessed by that 512M and the yellow and blue interior 599. But basically, I'm in Ferraris. I would just happily walk away with any of the Ferraris in this room. But yeah, let me know below and stay subscribed because yes, still more videos to come from Dubai.